Uh oh. <laughs> I, I forget that that is a savage behavior. Yeah. <laughs> what, I, what the fuck? You, just, you opened it with your teeth. I just opened them with one hand. I'm built different, I guess. Uh, so, you are Ralph Benz. I am. You are. That's my name. That is your name. You are a game designer. I am. By choice and by passion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. By, uh, I guess that's true. Both of those things, yeah. No one forced me. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Just wait until crutch time. <laughs> right. Then, then you're forced. Yeah. So, you grew up in Medford, Wisconsin. I did. Population tiny. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> but not small enough that we don't have our own version of Monopoly. Uh-oh. I'm not kidding. Medfordopoly. It's a thing. Oh, an actual Monopoly board? Yeah. What the hell? Okay, so... I don't know why. I, I can explain it. <laughs> it's the tiniest town in the world. Right. <laughs> well, no, it's... Population, like, 0. 0.7, which... <laughs> do the math. But everyone we know, no matter where we go in the U.S., is from there. True. It's 100% true. They're either from there or they know of it. <laughs> How? <laughs> I don't know. Random people we've met through various life circumstances are just like, oh, yeah, I know Medford. I'm like, How? How do you know Medford? We go to business conferences and they're like, oh, yeah, Medford. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I don't get it. What drove you to game design and how did starting there affect your journey? Well, uh, as mentioned, it's the tiniest town. Um, I do not like small towns. <laughs> I wanted to be in a bigger town where there were things. Um, and because I lived in... Such a small town. There was nothing to do there. There was a bowling alley and a movie theater, which I suppose makes us a big town in terms of, uh, you know, Midwest uh, sizing. But um, I also lived 15 minutes outside of said town, 15 minute drive outside of said town. And so pretty much my constant companion was either going in the woods to be eaten by bears, which didn't sound like a fun time, or uh, playing video games. And... So I, my first video game I ever played was on a Game Boy Pocket, one of the big fat ones. Oh, yeah. So not Game Boy Pocket, regular Game Boy, big fat yellow one. Um, <laughs> and it was like an Animaniacs game, I think. Oh, they had yeah. like a platformer. Yeah. That was not good. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was my first game. And then I played Pokemon, and then it then it was all over. You know, I was a gamer forever at, at that point. Oh. Um, I don't know why Pokemon, like Pokemon 1, mm -hmm. both of them, actually, and Yellow. I don't know why they were so good and so addicting. Like, the, If you look into how they're coded and how they were designed it's a it's a dumpster fire like they they are barely held together and yet somehow just a, a cultural phenomenon you know um the glitches became lore yeah good old missing no and all that uh all the fun stuff and, and mew under the truck and everything the shiny pokemon which i think was originally a fake stat which fucked up the color yes it was something like that and there were, in the first game, shinies weren't like a quote-unquote real thing. It was, yeah, it was, a, it was a glitch. And only certain Pokemon could be shinies, I think, because of that glitch. I don't, don't, <laughs> quote, don't quote me on that. Um, but then they put it in intentionally in Gen 2 because people kept liking trying to find mm -hmm. all the, these different colored Pokemon. Um, Anyway, we were talking about my journey. <laughs> I got sidetracked. But yeah, um, so, you know, started started playing games very young. And I, because I played so many games, I started to notice patterns and, um, like, j just, I started to understand what the developers were going for when I, when I was playing games. Um, I think the, 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 the thing that did me in well, as in terms of like I, you know, I played Pokemon really young, but the thing that really like it uh, to use to use uh, the young parlance, it cooked me right. I I'm, <laughs> I got cooked. Um, was World of Warcraft? Oh yeah, it was very. Uh, it was formative. You have a little <laughs> bit of experience in that game. <laughs> uh, last I checked, a year and a half of playtime, like in game playtime. 
Um, I granted, I haven't played much the past couple expansions because wasn't that only when it was recorded? Yeah, there was a time when I think they weren't recording playtime, and there were like other characters that are lost to time because you can only check like on a character when you're logged in. Ah. Uh. And there are some of my characters I ended up deleting and stuff, so the, <laughs> those hours are lost to time, but at least the last time I checked. That's a lot of time. So It is. What got you stuck so hard into WoW? Mm. Well, one, it was, it's a massive game. And, like, nowadays, they really want you to not play their game, <laughs> as weird as that sounds. Um, nowadays, it's very much about getting you to like max level and finish the story real quick and then get into their endless grind you know of of gear and and stuff but when i played back in the day it was a lot slower it was more methodical it was really about exploring mm -hmm. um and just like seeing these these zones and all the different like because like it, one thing they did really well was each zone and they still do this well to this day each zone is so unique from the other ones, uh, even like the ones that are direct neighbors to them. Like, um, oh man, I'm forgetting what that one is called. Uh, the one that's for my for my WoW nerd listening. Uh, the <laughs> one just south of Elwyn Forest. Um, <laughs> gosh, why can't I remember it? Anyway, um, it's like it's like very like the the amber fields of grain. You know, like mm -hmm. there's it's like a farming zone, and there's you know, just like uh, it's very like dry and rocky, but its direct neighbor to the to the east, uh, Duskwood, is like this spooky forest for like the entire zone, and the town gets randomly attacked by monsters and stuff. Um, Sounds like my kind of place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd like Duskwood. It's fun. Um, it's too bad that there's no reason to go back to all these places like mm. nowadays. Once you grind them out, you're kind of done. Yeah, but I don't know. It, it was fun back in the day. But anyway, yeah, the exploration. Just like everything being so fresh and so new and just this giant world to explore that felt basically endless when I was young. You know, like, because I didn't understand how things worked, right? I thought that it would literally go forever, you know? Like, there was literal, literally no end. And to an extent, that's not incorrect. I mean, it's so big that, like, you'd have to spend... A lot more time than even I spent to see it all. <laughs> well, more than a year and a half straight, no sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that was only for one summer. Um, <laughs> the first summer that I really got into Warcraft, um, it was just after Wrath of the Lich King launched. I had played it previously, um, and there's a story about that that we can tell later. Um, but uh, Is yeah. that your origin story? The, of my name yeah yeah i was planning to ask about that okay so we will come back to well that. yeah we'll we'll tell that story later um but yeah the first summer that i played right after wrath of the lich king launched i played sun up to sundown all summer i didn't stop it was it was crazy like three months of solid wow and <laughs> uh it got it got so bad that I actually kind of forgot how to write. <laughs> like, so I, I mean, I was in middle school, right? Um, it was, I think it was the summer of fifth grade. And when I got back, I was uh, to school. I was just like, I, I forgot how to write because I was <laughs> typing so much, you know? Oh yeah. But it taught me how to type really well. That's ingrained in my brain. Now, the last time I clocked my words per minute, it was at 210, and that's the speed that stenographers type at. But I am not a stenographer, obviously. I type <laughs> You're on the regular just a keyboard. hardcore gamer. I just type really fast. Well, back before the mics, you'd have to be like, oh shit, help. That's or, right. Medic, yeah. res please. Exactly. You know, you're you're typing out commands to people. Like, you know, if you're, if you're in a raid or a dungeon or something, you gotta, like, type to people real quick. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's what, that's what prompted that. I mean, I learned how to read from Final Fantasy, what, four? Technically two in America. But either way, yeah. it's like if you didn't read the text, you were fucked. Right. Like you did not know where to go. Mm -hmm. You'd spend like 40 hours just pissing around in the same desert. Yep. 
and then you'd, you'd start the entire game over. <laughs> Because you're lost. Yep. Text-based yeah. games before mics were great for education. Mm, true. <laughs> true. You had incentive to pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we were talking about why I moved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, get out of the small town. And I figured for my career, I was like, listen, I, I was like, I have so much like passion and have accumulated so much like anecdotal knowledge for games and game design it just made sense so i was looking for schools in wisconsin that had a game design degree um i ended up moving to sun prairie wisconsin just outside of madison and uh getting my degree in game design and I liked the big city, not living like downtown in a big city. That's crazy. Anybody who lives downtown in a big city, I don't know how you do it, but like, you know, on in, in the suburbs, right? The amenities are nice to drive. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I stayed and cause I made a lot of good friends and, uh, hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the, you know, here we are. I don't work in game design currently. <laughs> because as it turns out, there's not exactly a lot of career opportunities in Madison, Wisconsin for game design. There are a couple studios, and I applied to all of them, and I didn't get anything at all, yeah. any of them. So I did my fallback career of IT, because I've been building my own computer since I was like 15. So mm -hmm. Back to WoW. <laughs> get back to WoW, <laughs> exactly. That, that did prompt it. I was like, I want a good computer to play WoW, and I don't have the money to buy a, like, super expensive you know pre-built gaming machine but if i buy the parts myself it'll be like you know half the cost yeah and it is build your own machine yes. audience please build your own computers it's just like a legos for adults you'll figure it out look up a guide <laughs> it's it's fine although i have to admit the glue on the uh not the condenser oh man thermal paste yes the thermal paste yeah on the processor yes God, I haven't touched the inside of my computer. I built a really nice computer, and yeah. I'm just like, edit videos and focus on podcasts. You know, you're supposed to replace your thermal paste every few years. Oh. <laughs> I guess I have to do the scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> just a pea-sized glop right in the center. You're fine, okay? You don't have to do, like, a weird wavy do that some people, like, say. It's just a pea-sized glob. It'll compress and spread out. You'll be fine. It's just like tiling. Yeah. I do home renovations in my past work history to anyone who doesn't know. But yeah, it's just like tiling. Although don't, for God's sake, don't fucking tile crooked. I will hate everything about you. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is a complete tangent. I saw a random video of someone laying tiles and they were laying the tile, like putting it into the the putty what do you call it the, yeah, the glue stuff uh yeah. putty cement like yeah whatever they were laying it into the to the putty and then hitting it with a hammer and <gasps> it cracks oh no and then they push that down in further they're like it's modern like no it's it, broken it looks terrible <laughs> it's also gonna be really sharp i know anyway that's a thing oh no uh okay uh the wow. pain the pain on your face back to wow okay. i know i'm trying to not there's a lot of pain on my face. Like, <laughs> this is like, okay, back to tiling. This, <laughs> this is like going into truck stops and having to pee in a urinal. Right. Ladies, you wouldn't understand. Uh, <laughs> but you got to pee in a urinal. And if you've done tiling and you try to do quality, you notice everywhere all of these fucking crooked tiles. And it's maddening. Mm -hmm. It is maddening. They're... No one knows how to tile, although there's a lot of new contractors who are making the new buildings who do it with either machines or perfectly or with spacers or something. Because mm -hmm. people have finally started tiling smoothly and with actual lines. Oh my god, it's so nice. Ah, oh, I just hate crooked tiles. <laughs> and you're forced every time at a truck stop. Mm -hmm. Anyways... Back to well. <laughs> yeah, okay. There's no smooth transition back. No, there is not. <laughs> so, Mr. Ralph. Yeah. You are Naraxis. You have created a famous WoW character. True. You are the famous Naraxis. I am. What is the origin story 
of Naraxis. All right. So just this morning, I looked it up to make sure I had the times timelines correct. Okay. Because it was when I was young, <laughs> and I, you, I don't remember. I don't remember anything back then, man. <laughs> um. So, uh. So as mentioned, I had pl- I had played WoW before the, uh, the the summer of of the summer of WoW. Um, <laughs> And I was I was younger even, and I didn't know what I was doing. WoW had like it had just came out, I believe, and because uh, I you know there were commercials for it everywhere, oh, yeah. right? And uh, so I was like, Mom, I want to play WoW. <laughs> so <laughs> she got it for me, um, and I played it for a little bit, and I did not know what I was doing. So I thought I mentioned earlier the zone uh, Duskwood. Um, so I got, I was, I was following the questing and I, I got through, cause I could kind of understand how to do that. And I got through the, so I got through the first couple zones. I got to Duskwood and I don't know if I just couldn't find the quests or what was going on. I just completely like failed to understand what was happening, but I had found this, this area, uh, in in like the mountains of that of that zone with a bunch of spiders like there was just like these caves of of spiders and i was playing as a paladin because i because i remember i was like i was like ah a paladin would kill all the spiders because they're evil (laughs) (laughs) um and so i so i was i literally would just like log in and kill spiders for hours in Mm -hmm. that in that area right in there and my character was named Naraxis. I don't remember why I came up with that name. <laughs> um, I have no clue. Maybe I was just hitting letters on the keyboard. <laughs> um, and so I was. I would just kill spiders. I did it for like a couple weeks. Um, and a couple then, weeks? Yeah, it was a couple weeks. Again, I was very easily entertained as a child, apparently. <laughs> I wish I could go back to that. Anyway, so yeah, I would I would just kill spiders. And eventually, uh, this was back, you know, back in the day when Game Masters actually, like, paid attention to their game and would, like, talk to people in their game. Mm-hmm. Um, a Game Master talked to me and said, hey, we, uh, I noticed you've been in this area a lot for, you know... The, for the past the, for the for the past couple of weeks, did you find like a bug here? Like, is there something wrong? You know, we just wanted to check in <laughs> <laughs> because I get you know when that game launched, the the game masters were a lot more active in the in like in the player base. They would like walk around. You could tell who they were. They had a special robe that was like black and it was black with blue trim. No other robe in the game looked like that, so you knew who they were. And you could just talk to them and ask them questions and stuff because they wanted to make sure that everybody was having a good time. It's a lot different from nowadays. <laughs> um, but anyway, so this, so yeah, this game I was talking about, like, oh, I just, I ran out of quests. I'm not sure where to go. And I was just having fun killing spiders. And he was like, oh, well, if you go uh, over here to, the, to this town, you should be able to find some more quests. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And so I left. <laughs> and then, you know, Fast forward, I stopped playing eventually. I don't know if I got bored or what, but fast forward a couple of years when I started playing again, you know, I had more, I was more cognizant of, of what was going on, uh, you know, having gained a couple of years of living. Um, and I was like, I went, I was leveling up again. I went, uh, I got to, to Duskwood and I, I was like, I remember I killed spiders here a lot. And I went back. <laughs> to to the to the mountains in the caves and i was killing spiders but there was a new spider so in so in wow there are uh rare enemies that you can find sometimes they have a little like silver dragon around their portrait and they usually drop rare loot unique loot um and uh and i was playing uh i was playing a hunter uh now and uh i i got into this cave I was, I was killing all the spiders and I saw a rare spawn spider named Naraxis in the cave. <laughs> and I was like, I was just shocked. I was like, <laughs> what? This wasn't here last. And then I was like, wait a sec. That was what I called my character back in the day. And I was like, I was like, no way. That's so cool. And then, <laughs> and then I kill, I killed the spider 
and uh, it dropped a chainmail vest called Naraxis's Naraxus, Hauberk. Nice. Um, was it for paladins? Yeah, because you back in that back in that time, um, you uh, paladins had to start out by wearing chainmail armor and could get plate mail at like level forty or something. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you had to start as chainmail, and it's it was a chainmail hauberk. So <laughs> I thought that was really cool. If you wanna if you wanna go see the spider for yourself, uh, listeners, you can look it up on wowhead.com. Just, <laughs> just type in Naraxis, it'll come up. Uh, that's N A R. No, N A R A X I. Naraxis, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to spell from like just saying letters. Anyway. The terrible thing about you being famous as Naraxis now is everybody keeps taking your fucking everybody steals, username. Everybody steals my name constantly. I can never have my name. It's so maddening. Yeah. I don't even know I don't even know if famous is the right word. It's just a random rare mob in, <laughs> in Warcraft, and everyone still steals my name. Cool enough to get username stolen. I guess so. And then, like, I came up with, uh, and then another name I've used previously uh, for, I used it for a D&D character. <laughs> um, uh, the Vantus is, oh, yeah. is that name. And, I, like, a year after I started, this was for, like, a campaign, a D&D campaign that lasted for, like, four or five years. It was really long. Mm-hmm. Awesome, though. Um, but, so, Vantus was a... Uh, the the name of my character. I am not even kidding you. In the next expansion of WoW that came out, there was a new item called a Vantus rune, spelled the same way I spelled my <laughs> character. And I'm like, but that one that's di- that's different. That's, that's just a weird coincidence. That's a weird coincidence. Yes. Your brains work the same. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a coincidence. But still, very. Uh, I was like, are you kidding me? It was just it was funny. <laughs> that one you might be able to get the username of. Uh, no, they don't let you name your character the same as items. Oh, interesting. They're also a very common item, so people know mm. what they are. So that one actually gets taken more often. But you still got to battle for Naraxxus all the time. I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> I don't even have the... You can't name, you can't name your characters after... Um, Rare mobs. Yeah, you can't any any name that's in the game that's like a unique name or like for a rare mob you can't use as your character name just by default. I had I still had the the character name Naraxis up to a a certain time because I got it before it was in the game. Um, but then I had to do a server transfer because my server died, and then to like literally zero players, so I had to transfer off to a server that had players, and I couldn't get my I couldn't keep my name. I was oh, very sad. That sucks. Yeah. That was very sad. But, again, no smooth transition on this. <laughs> yeah, just go for it. So, I started on Demon Souls. Okay. Getting back to the Elden Ring theme of this episode. No, <laughs> is that what we're talking about? It's been... <laughs> Give or take. The, the goal is to eventually talk about it. Okay, so, let me gotcha. shoehorn that in. <laughs> Perfect. Sounds good. But, yeah, I started on Demon Souls before okay. Dark Souls. Right. Which I think was renamed because they had a different company work on it, but I'm not positive. Yeah, Sony owned the Demon Souls IP, and then they want FromSoft wanted to make another game in that vein, but they didn't want to fund a Demon Souls too, so they named it Dark Souls. Yeah, which uh, Sony, get off your ass! Please uh, make Demon Souls for PC already and Bloodborne. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that will be a reoccurring theme. <laughs> it will. We will battle to the death over this. We'll get to that. If Demon Souls comes first, I will punch you in the face. Yep, we just got to that. Okay, now that we've covered this. <laughs> <laughs> but Demon Souls was first. Either way, well, one of yeah, us will be original. happy. Anyway. Okay, so moving on to that whole <laughs> yes. storyline here. Uh-huh. So I started on Demon Souls way back before Dark Souls and Bloodborne and Elden Ring. It's all part of the, what is it? Soulsborne. Soulsborne, yeah. yeah. It's all part of the Soulsborne series, for anyone who doesn't know. The three people living under a rock. Mm -hmm. Um, What is your favorite game of all of these series? And who would you tell to play that one first? Well, Bloodborne's my favorite. Bloodborne's an interesting beast because it... (laughs) uh, Because it very much has a lot of Souls design concepts. However, the combat is much quicker. Mm -hmm. And... uh, it's almost a whole different flavor. Yeah, it's so it's 
It's not quite as different as something like Sekiro, but it is definitely its own its own thing. Um, as far as who should play it first, I think everyone should play Bloodborne. Bloodborne's great. Also, uh, bring it to PC. Um, oh, don't play Bloodborne with TV lag. Do yeah, do not. I played it with two hundred millisecond lag, and oh my god, it it's was terrible. A, it was. It's a nightmare. You can't play that with terrible lag. You cannot. It is a is a counter based combat. Yeah, that's why it needs to come to PC so that people can actually play it. Wait, Bloodborne's not on PC yet. Oh, we just had that. Conversation. We're not paying attention. <laughs> I was. It's just it. It's just so foreign to me. Bloodborne uh, should be everywhere. It should be. It's there. It's currently. It's literally unfathomable. My brain can't grasp yeah, it. <laughs> Bloodborne is currently the highest selling Sony exclusive. Uh, game that has not been ported from the PS4 era. All of the other ones have been ported or have like a remake or something that was then ported. Bloodborne's the highest selling one that has not been ported yet. I'm tempted to pirate it for PC. You can. Just to say of. fuck them. I think uh, <clears throat> legality, uh, you should not pirate <laughs> games unless you own the original disc. Um, Which I, wait, do I, I own it? I don't know if I do. I actually have to check my shelf. Anyways. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, you may legally make backup copies of your games if you currently own the medium that it was originally released on. So, legal disclaimer aside. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that that exists. I think you can... Don't don't 100% quote me on that, but I think years ago there was this... Um, there was like a, a, a fan project that was trying to get it working on PC. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was that they tied a lot of the game's code to the frame rate. And so oh. if it went all the way up to 60, then the it, essentially the game ran at double speed. Which I have no issues with low frames. I know you and I are on opposite spectrums we, on this. We are. <laughs> I'm used to playing on um, potatoes mm -hmm. that had like countable pixels. <laughs> and I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. I love my NES games. I still play... Freaking Blaster Master and Simon's Quest. Oh, so good. Anyways. Anyway. Aside from my nostalgia gasm. Uh, you like your frames. I do like my frames. And that's why it drives me crazy that Bloodborne's on PS4. Um, <laughs> is, is the PS4 locked on certain maximums? I think there's not a single PS4 game that can go up to 60. There might be. The PS4 Pro had some games that could go up to 60 using the additional power um but games had to have a ps4 pro mode added to them mm -hmm. in order to do that and bloodborne came out so far before then yeah. and they never ended up adding one i think if you play it on a ps4 pro now though you'll you'll get less frame dips because mm -hmm. it there are certain areas in that game where like it struggles to do 20 <laughs> but it's I, I find that shit charming. Like, it would be really annoying with that kind of combat, but mm -hmm. when the machine reminds you that, oh, this game's a chonker. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it, I, it's, it's literally a crime that it's being held hostage. Like, it, that game would be gorgeous with, like, a texture rework, and, I mean, it already is in its own way, but it, it could be, like, it would be, oh, my God, it looks so good with, like, a texture overhaul and then on modern platforms. God, I wish it was on PC. I was thinking about streaming it. <laughs> well. I was like, oh man, like if you recommend it, like if you truly pick that as number one, which I was pretty sure you would. Yeah. I'll finally play through it. I'll buy a brand new edition for PC. Oh, I wish. Nope. Although I have a suspicion um, that we might, that and look, for anybody that's been on the Bloodborne like <laughs> PC cope train for a while, <laughs> Um, I actually think we genuinely might be getting close because um, the creator of the Souls series and Bloodborne and everything, um, Miyazaki, not the not the Ghibli Miyazaki, not Hayao Miyazaki. Other, yes, uh, Hidetaka Miyazaki is his name. I think. I think so. Yeah. That's right. Um, uh, so for a long time, uh, before the Demon Souls remake came out, uh, Miyazaki would not acknowledge it existed. Like, if anybody asked him about Demon Souls, he'd be like, I don't know what that is. Like, <laughs> he would legitimately, he'd either ignore them or be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Demon Souls was so flavorful. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, 
the fucking prison with the Cthulian paralyzing bell. Yeah. Oh my god, those guys are so goddamn scary. Dripping with atmosphere. Yeah. Ah, such a good game. Mm-hmm. But I like the atmosphere and such. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, the, he wouldn't acknowledge it existed until about a year before the remake was announced. Mm. Then he suddenly started being like, oh yeah, Demon Souls, that was a thing. And the same thing just happened with Bloodborne. Like, in an interview, like, I think it was maybe six months ago or something. Not too long ago. Um, he acknowledged, he said the word Bloodborne. I know that seems crazy. Anybody who's listening <laughs> is like, what, what are you talking about? No, you don't understand. The same thing happened with Demon Souls. And it, when anyone asked him about Bloodborne before that point, he would ignore them. Just like with Demon Souls. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, in an interview, he mentioned Bloodborne. I forget what he said about it, but he said the name, and that's what's important. <laughs> and then, in an interview like a month ago, somebody asked him, um, he was asked directly, like, is Bloodborne ever going to come to PC? And he, he answered. He said, uh, I'll get in trouble if I answer that, but I can say that there, that the, there were two other developers on the couch with him. He, he said, I can say that these two would love to see it on uh, on PC, and lots of other people would would say that too. Um. So I don't. Know, I've got a little bit of hope. I'm. I'm expect. I. I think that when Sony announces the PS5 Pro, which will either be later this year or early next year that they do the announcement, they're going to announce Bloodborne remake for it, maybe a sequel as well, and then they're also going to put the remake on PC. That's my expectation. I find it really weird. I feel like Sony's PlayStation should just be a computer at this point. I think they should just... I mean, they should follow Xbox's example and just have everything on PC as well. Because, like, the everything is so connected now. And, like, I they know... They should have a gaming platform and then just make it accessible from PS5. Because yeah. you can do all the surfing on PS5. Right. It's basically a fake computer. Yeah. Which, I don't get why they have, like, the browser and all this and that. First of all, it's chunky. You should be able to hook a mouse up to a PS5. Yeah, well. That would make it so much more accessible. It would. That's true. I Actually, you might be able to, but you can't use it for games. I think that... Which isn't... Uh, they do that for competitive... For equalizer. For, yeah. for esports. Which is, like, I get it. Like, the esports are... They're trying so hard to make esports a giant thing. All of the companies are. And it just, like, hasn't become a giant well, thing. you, you know? can't. Like, the only reason that games become competitive, like, markets, if you will, like, the only reason there's championships is the game itself is so good. Mm-hmm. End of story. People yep. decide, oh, I'm better at Smash Brothers 1 on the 64 than you. Yeah. Like, we have a... There's a channel. I'm going to actually plug him. He works at a Chinese food store. And he and a couple buddies have business cards printed out. And he's like, he saw my t-shirt. Uh, I was wearing something. And he's like, oh, do you like games? Like, do you like fighter games? And he hit me up. And he's been doing for like, God, I want to say like 16 years, a tiny YouTube channel of wow. his local Street Fighter games. <laughs> and it's like, I have his business card on my desk to this day. Wow. Because that guy inspires me. Like, he's a tiny channel. Like, for 16 years, he should be huge. Mm -hmm. But he's tiny, and he's still fucking plugging away, happy as can be, like, talking to people. It's like, that guy's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It takes a lot of determination to put that much effort in and not, I mean, his reward must be his own, you know. Yeah, he's just got to love it. He just loves it. Yeah, that's, that's great. So for my tiny audience... Go check out this guy. Link on the top of the YouTube thing. If I can find a way to do it on Spotify and everything else, I will. But I'm new to it. I don't do podcasts. I watch them on YouTube because I'm a heathen. (laughs) (laughs) But so you would recommend to anyone or to most people start on Bloodborne? I think so. And the reason I think that is because the Souls series is probably done right like dark souls i think is is finished i don't think they're gonna make another dark souls um i think they went downhill i would agree i mean so dark souls one was oh my god so janky but so good demon souls was way slower pace i think a little more jank they polished it for dark souls it was even more jank but it was so (laughs) charming and it's like Mm -hmm. 
prehistoric times gaming. Yeah. Oh man, oh, Demon man. Demon Souls had a lot of design choices that really made. <laughs> Ooh, uh, man, they punished you for being bad, which was. Oh my god, I loved it. Which was insane. It was twisted, but holy shit, the repercussions. Yeah. Whenever you die, the world became darker or lighter, depending on if you beat a boss or if you f died. Each time you would die, it would stack the like evality in the world because they would also take your soul because everything's about souls and accumulation of souls if you died the world would take your soul and souls and become harder and harder and harder and harder yep and so if you died by lore of the game you were adding to the pool of souls strengthening against you yep and you would lose half your max hp unless you found your blood stain yep <laughs> which is just ah. it's so dark and so like gritty i fucking loved it mm -hmm. i would get to a point where i'd be like four or five deaths in i'd be really early in the game and i'm like you know what fuck it <laughs> and i would start over <laughs> yeah restart i l let's just say there's a reason why demon souls never took off that hard <laughs> hey <laughs> <laughs> for those of you that play it i love you <laughs> you are my friend right now <laughs> it's decided and then there's Ralph. It was, <laughs> no, it was a good game. I th I think it was a good oh. game. I definitely not recommend it as your first Souls game. If you were yeah, let's let's put it this way: if you have played the other Souls games and you want more, D Demon Souls remake or original, I guess. But remake. I haven't tried the remake because I don't it's have the console. Exactly the same. It is th the exact same game. Mm -hmm. So like. They probably just prettied it up. Yeah, like janky parries, overpowered spells, everything is all, it's all as it was. Um, oh, but it, it's, it's like the noir version, like the dark, gritty, like everything's a little slower paced. You can see the attacks coming, but if you start a parry before or you time it wrong, you have time to realize, oh shit, I fucked up, here yeah. it comes. <laughs> and then you die. And then you get hit. <laughs> yeah. And I actually really like that because it reminds me of real combat. Mm -hmm. Because um, I do armored combat for anyone who doesn't know. When you see the strike coming, you know you're fucked before you're hit unless yep. they're really good. And then you're just fucked anyways. Like, realistically. The mind moves faster than the body. It does. Mm -hmm. And that's why Demon Souls, aside from all the atmosphere and like dripping tastiness, I'm like, oh, I'm a sucker for atmosphere and exploration, and that game had me. Mm -hmm. The mind will move faster than the body is a perfect way to put it. And that shows you it. Mm -hmm. so, but I guess I do like more down-to-earth games than you, which explains why Demon Souls vs. Bloodborne. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, getting back to why you should play <laughs> Bloodborne first. Um, so yeah, original Dark Souls, very janky. Cult classic, though. Lots of yeah. There were a lot of people that really liked it. If you like it, you'll like it. If you don't, don't push through it. Correct. Um, <laughs> then Dark Souls 2 came out. And Dark Souls 2 is a bit of a pariah amongst the Souls community. Um, it was not as good. Correct. It had some weird design choices. It almost felt like they were trying to bring back some of Demon Souls and the magic that Demon Souls had, but combine it with Dark Souls. But it doesn't work. They focused on the... I, I think... Strong opinion here. I think Dark Souls was trying to focus on the wrong things from Demon Souls. Mm -hmm. And they tried to over-process level design. And it came out like really copy-pasty. They only kept really dry things from Dark Souls. Um, they did smooth out like a couple things like combat and like things we complained about, which mm -hmm. was a great step towards Dark Souls 3. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they didn't pull all the right things, which just happened to blend together in a mistake yeah but yeah so yeah dark souls 2 doesn't dark exist souls, dark souls 3 um took a lot of design cues from bloodborne yep. um including faster combat the combat's much faster and if you're gonna play a souls game like a dark souls game um i think you should start with three if you want any FromSoft game uh, modern FromSoft game to start with, I'd say Bloodborne. Um, so, Dar yeah, Dark Souls 3 had really, really fine-tuned the Souls formula at that point. Mm -hmm. And by taking some design cues from Bloodborne's combat specifically and making it more fast-paced, 
um, it really helped Dark Souls 3 get a lot of success. Um, where, yeah. yeah, just like when 3 came out, people were catching on, right? They were like, okay, this company makes a very specific brand of game very well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, uh, but yeah, def I think the reason why I think that Dark Souls as a series is done is because of Elden Ring. <laughs> Getting to the topic of the podcast, finally. Let me jump back to Dark Souls. Okay. The thing that I like about Dark Souls, because I would say Dark Souls 1, when I say Dark Souls, mm -hmm. I think Dark Souls 1 is actually better than 3, but I like heavier combat. I like the Shadow of the Colossus feel. I don't want to be scurrying up it like I'm Sonic from Frontiers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But not going to say Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 were better games because mm -hmm. they polished so many things. Dark Souls one's a little hard to play now. It is a little hard to play. <laughs> my uh, my partner uh, Jay, he's working. He's trying to get into the Souls series for like for me. Essentially, mm. he wants to know why I like it so much, and um, it's it's rough. I mean, he wants to start from the beginning, from Dark Souls, not from not from Demon Souls, from Dark Souls one. Um, the poor forgotten child. I know. Um, <laughs> but there's no way for him to play Demon Souls, really, unless... Uh... I'll find a way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that would be an even worse experience for him, so let's not go yeah. there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, watching him play and, and struggle through it, I'm just like, I'm trying to encourage him to be like, maybe you should just start with, like, Elden Ring, because it's more... Yeah, if you get frustrated, you can just go elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Which, that's one thing I did like about Demon's Souls, is there were five areas, mm -hmm. and it was very gauntlet. Like, you pick your area, you go between them, you level up, and you come back to it. Mm -hmm. Like, that was a really nice thing. But, yeah, Elden Ring... Uh, it is... I almost want to say overhyped, because I think the... I almost said free-to-play. I think the sandboxy worldness isn't the right choice for a Dark Souls game, like old Dark Souls. Yeah, it's it's new. <laughs> it's it's a weird choice. Granted, I like when the dragons just randomly fly out of nowhere and they're like, you're in a swamp. There's, There's a dragon. dragon. That is pretty great. It's like, oh man, I should run like hell. <laughs> yeah. But I, mean, I want to kill it. The fun the fun thing about that for I know exactly which dragon you're talking about. If you um if you're exploring around the area you can actually find an NPC underneath like a, a stone arch with like a campfire by him, and he'll warn you about the dragon. Oh, but you have to find that, and if you don't find it, well, yeah, I did the classic turn right, and that led me to the oops. Yep, and lots of fire. Yep, and a few resurrections. Yep. <laughs> oh man, uh, it's rough though, because you get to certain areas on accident, and you're like, oh, this is a really cool area, like. Right off the bat, if you find the poison catacombs oh, yeah. that you have to run forever through. Yep. With the chariots and all that. Yeah. Yep. I did that at like level one. Oh, that was a mistake. It was, but I did it. Because <laughs> that's Elden Ring and it's like, it's, it's not guided. And I think the lack of tightness of game design is what bothers me with the levels and exploration. Mm. I love exploration. In WoW, I was actually guilty of being the asshole who was like, I'm just going to run from place to place and then just get slaughtered by any random bug that finds me. Yeah. But it was so cool. Back to WoW, exploring the world. But it's so... It's hard in Elden Ring. Because, mm -hmm. oh man, it does not scale well and if you don't pay attention, you just die everywhere. Yeah. Because it's a Soulsborne game. You need... <laughs> so the thing with Elden Ring is like, the beginning of it is tougher than the end of it in some ways, which is strange. Um, is it because you get the mechanics and you get smooth? Yeah, and you get more tools. Uh, like, the, the, the thing about all of the Soulsborne games is that the more tools you accumulate, the easier the time is going to be as long as you're utilizing them. Huh. Like, for Elden Ring, um, I'm currently... I'm, I started a new playthrough to make a new character for the DLC because... Um, the character that I was playing previously, I saw a bunch of people, uh, like rec a bunch of like content creators, um, who had like the press build. They were recommending 
uh, for the DLC to make sure that you're not going to just go in there and like slaughter everything in like one hit with your super OP end game character. Mm. Um, they were recommending you be at level 125 to 150 with uh, about 60 vigor, uh, 60 points of vigor. Hmm. So, so they wanted to actually enjoy the game. Yeah. It's so weird though. Like that's what I'm talking about. The design and balance and guidance. Mm -hmm. It just can't do it because it's so free form. It is. And you have to actually look up content creators and be like, what do they recommend? The people who've spent hours doing the wrong thing. Can I borrow their experience and play it the way it was designed to? And it's like, it's such a weird. I don't, I don't know if I necessarily totally agree with that take. I think that. I think that Elden Ring was very much designed for, like, there, there is some guidance in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, when you sit at certain bonfires, or sites of grace, uh, there will be, like, a golden light that points in a direction. Oh, yeah. That's where you're supposed to go, <laughs> quite yeah. simply. Um, however, sometimes they will lead you astray if you don't do enough side exploration. I don't think Elden Ring is a game that's designed for you to see everything. You know, um, a lot of open world games, uh, th and, and I think that Elden Ring's open world is actually quite well designed. Um, a lot of the modern open world games we see very much like try to like try to give you reasons to see every single inch of it. I will explain, like, I'll actually go back and explain why I think it's poorly designed for me, mm. but continue. Okay. Um, I, I'll mainly, I'll mainly, uh, shit on Ubisoft here because I don't like <laughs> their modern open world games. Um, b despite them being one of the pioneers of the modern open world with like Far Cry 3, you know, um, I am sick of climbing radio towers. Please Ubisoft, stop it. Um, yeah. the, so those, those open worlds were very much designed for you to see every single inch of it. They were like. Collect the flags. Collect the flags. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> go, you know, find me every single red flower. You know, like, there were... There's 3,000 of them. Yeah, it, it's it's like, you know, if you don't see everything in our game, then we don't like you anymore. You it's know, like... Like the, like the fucking Koroks. Yeah. Giving you a golden poop hat. <laughs> oh, man, Link, why did you do this to me? I will get back to <laughs> Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom in just a minute. Um, because I have strong feelings about them that nobody agrees with, but I'm correct. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, the, I was talking about something. Um, yeah, open worlds. Um, so, Elden Ring is not designed for you to see everything. I think that Elden Ring is designed with the intention that you don't look up anything, but that you follow, um, you, you follow the limited guidance that they give you, but then like it, it very much trusts you to be your own player is, yeah. is the thing. Like they expect you to follow their guidance that they put in the game, the, the little golden lights and stuff. And then strike out on your own a little bit, not scour every inch of the map. Which comes back to me. <laughs> yeah, and me too, to an extent, but... Oh man, I am the asshole who's like, let me 100% the first chapter, yeah. and then continue to two. I'm the same way. And then 100%, and then for chapter three, uh, maybe 50%, and then I'll get bored by five. Yeah, I'm the same way. <sighs> it's so hard, because... You enjoy the world, and it's like Elden Ring is beautiful, and it's fun to explore, and the dungeons are great. Mm -hmm. Like, fuck, what is his name? Uh, Smithers. Uh, patches. <laughs> patches. Patches. Fuck yeah. Patches. Smithers. <laughs> he Smithers. He's in every single Soulsborne game. Yep. I don't think he's in Armored Core, but he might be. I don't know. But that would be really funny. But I think he was in Demon Souls. Yep. Yeah, I thought so. That's where he started. Oh. Okay, I'm not going to go back to Demon Souls lore. Back to Elden Ring. He was even in Bloodborne. Anyway. Yeah, I'm the wrong kind of player for Elden Ring because I get too engrossed in an area and I want to complete it. Mm -hmm. And like you said, strike out on your own, trust the players to be a player, and it's like, eh, that, that really is what it's designed for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not supposed to find everything. That's just, that's just how it is. And I understand the frustration because I am also, I'm pretty similar in that I want to 
see everything in a game. Some of the monsters you just can't beat right out the gate. Yeah, you just can't. You have like to come back. Like that stupid tree sentinel. Yeah. You're not, you're absolutely not supposed to beat him right away. Nope. You're supposed to find him and get a real realization of, don't do this. Yeah. It, I think that that's great design, by the way. Yeah. He was great design. It makes it fun. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's hard because I think we were trained from the old games. Complete the area, then move on because you'll get locked out. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's just not how modern games require being because they can load. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah i uh, i, I want to go back to the tree sentinel for just a sec um, okay i think it's great that the first thing you see upon coming out of the tutorial is this big golden knight on a horse and like like patrolling this like hillside i think that's fantastic because the first thing i did when i saw him was like Come at me, bro. <laughs> I didn't have my horse yet. I didn't have anything. I had... I So when I, my first character I started in Elden Ring was the... Uh, waste, don't don't waste tell of, me depraved. Yeah. The Waste of Skin, I think they called it oh, in that no. game or whatever. Um, Rough. <laughs> I'm a Soulsborn veteran. Of course I started with that class. To anyone who doesn't know, that means you start with absolutely nothing with all your stats at one. Well, not one. I think it's like... 10. The lowest. But yeah, the lowest possible. Um, yeah. Uh, well, you don't start with nothing. You have a stick. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tree sentinel. It's immune to stick. <laughs> right. He's he's not immune to stick. He uh, he takes damage from it. One. One. A couple. <laughs> um, I just find it, uh, uh, that was the first I was like, yes, come at me. It's time for me to prove that I am a Souls veteran. <laughs> and so I, I ran up to him. And I was like, I, I, I smacked his horse on the leg, and he took, like, five damage. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, I've made a mistake. And then he smacked me with his shield into next year. I, I, I evaporated. Yeah. And I was like, ah, well, uh, maybe I'll come back to him. <laughs> and then I, got, I came back to him. But you see, I'm a Souls veteran, and so I know that I can cheese most bosses with magic. And so I found myself a faith uh, casting stick, whatever they're called in that yeah. game. The talisman? Talisman, that's it. Um, I found myself a talisman. I had a, like, holy bolt spell or something, and I was like, I was like, all right, perfect. I'm going to get this guy. I, come, I, I ride at him with my horse that I found. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to throw lightning at him from the back of my horse. This guy is screwed. <laughs> well, it turns out that his shield parries magic and shoots holy bolts back at you if you throw magic at him. Yep, I play casters usually. And, uh, and I was like, ah, well. They've outsmarted me again. <laughs> I was like, curse you. You know all my tricks. Um... Yeah, no, you had to use your martial skill on horseback, though. And that was a great teacher. It taught you mounted combat. And it showed you that this mounted boss is right outside the, the first area. You can come back to him whenever you want. You know exactly where he is. And it teaches you how to fight a person on horseback. Mm -hmm. It's a tutorial without being a tutorial, which yeah. is so good. It's This is what you could be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the Souls games are all about teaching through experience. Mm -hmm. That is what they are about. And, like, I'm going to be honest, like, when I played the first Souls game, I had, like, several come-to-Jesus moments with, <laughs> with myself, you know? I'm like, am I going to let this game beat me? I've died to Artorius 35 times in a row. <laughs> oh, yeah, you've got stories about Artorius. I love Artorius. Um... Yeah, I, I respect him. Like, he's so... And, you know, I'll get to... An, uh, remind me to come back to different builds having different experiences. Um, but for, for myself, like, that, that fight in Dark Souls 1 was so formative for me. It taught me about myself. Which is something that few other games that I've played can, can really, like, claim. Because it, it, it truly did, like, teach me how to persevere. Like, I played that oh, game man. when I was, like, I think 15 was when I played Dark Souls 1. Um, that was a long time ago. I know. 
And it really did. It taught me how to persevere. And it taught me that even when you fail, you can always gain something from the experience. Except your lost souls. Yes. <laughs> if you didn't pick up your souls, I'm sorry. Um, Die near the gate. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, the, the, the Souls games are incredible teachers through experience. That, that is something that they have always done very well. Even when that experience is some asshole hiding around a corner, grabbing you by the throat and stabbing you in the back. Yep. <laughs> like, yeah, that's not really fair, quote unquote, but that's exactly what that enemy would do in that situation, right? Like, if you're in that world and you hear someone, you hear explosions and lightning and death coming up the stairs, you damn bet you if all I've got is a knife and a robe, I'm hiding behind the corner. And when he walks past me, I'm going to stab him in the back. Yeah. Like, or they drop rocks on you, throw yep. things downstairs. Yep. That's, it's just how, it's just how it is. Tiny hallway firebomb. Yep. Get, stack up some powder kegs, throw yep. a firebomb. Yeah. Um, uh, Completely dark room melee combat. Ah, yes. Uh, That's always fun. Don't worry, they lock the door. Yep. <laughs> It's like, this is no longer an optional battle. Again, I know exactly where that is. Um, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but, All in yeah. the same area. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, yeah, Elden, Elden Ring, um, it's, it's open world. If you, the, the thing, if you 100% it, and you, oh. and you have every single tool at your disposal, yeah, the game's going to be a little easier. And to be honest, it should be. If you 100% it, mm-hmm. You should have a little advantage, you know? Um, I'll, I'll compare that to another game I've been playing, playing through again for the third time recently, Ghost of Tsushima. I thought you were going to say Tales of Vesperia. No. <laughs> Don't talk to me about Tales of Vesperia. Uh, we, uh, ziggy Ziggy. Uh, ziggy Zaggy. Ziggy Zaggy. Uh, me, me, and, uh, me and Gary, for the listeners, me and Gary played through that game together, and um, we missed... Two things. We were, we were following a guide to 100% that game. Tales of Asperia is an older game. It's, it's fantastic. It's, but a, it's a lot of hundreds of hours. It is a, a lot of hours. It is, and it is absolutely brutal with missing things. You will never know that you missed a side quest mm -hmm. unless you have a guide. Um, yeah. Which is, I, I don't necessarily agree with. I think there should be some sort of direction to point you towards things, but... And the item we missed, was it random chance or was it we didn't steal something from it was a boss? From a boss. We did not fulfill a special requirement during a boss fight. It was like when he was like overloading his mechanical heart or something, we had to do enough damage that self-destructed. Oh, yeah. And we failed to do that. Other than that, we 100%ed that crazy goddamn game. No, we missed one other side quest. Did we? We did. We missed talking to one guy oh, yeah. after one specific thing that you then can no longer talk to him after the next thing. <laughs> But we were so close. Um, anyway, in my heart, we one hundred percent. Yeah, we. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I was talking about Ghost of Tsushima. Um, I have played Ghost of Tsushima. This is the third time. I never play games more than once. It just doesn't happen. I don't have enough time. <laughs> and well, not only that, they just usually don't play well. There are a few games that hold my attention all the way till the end as well. Um, and that's. It remind me to talk about the game design cur the game designer curse later. <laughs> um, so Ghost of Tsushima is an open world game by Sucker Punch Studios. I love that game to death. The atmosphere is incredible. Um, it makes you feel like a badass samurai ninja. It is such a good game. It is the the story is incredible too. Back to the hundred percenting thing. I'm only at the end of Act Two. Oh. It took me so long to 100% those fuckers. Yeah, it takes a while. It really does. You don't have to. You can come back to stuff. To any listener, for God's sake, finish the story, then come back. Yeah, you can. I'm an idiot. Yeah, <laughs> you, you absolutely can just come back later. It's totally fine. Um, <laughs> it, the only, if you have the DLC, uh, the only thing is if you start the DLC, you can't come back to the main game until the DLC is done. Oh, interesting. So keep that in mind. Those are always weird decisions, but back to... Uh, but yeah, so I'm so I'm going to compare the what I was saying about Elden Ring to Ghost of Tsushima. Su Ghost of Tsushima. Um, so in Ghost of Tsushima, if you 100% the first 
zone, mm-hmm. you're going to have your bow and your longbow completely upgraded. You're going to have your sword at level 8 or 9 out of 10. You're going to have your assassination knife fully upgraded. You're going to have your armor set fully upgraded. You're going to have everything fully upgraded, basically, if you 100% the first act of that game. And then after that, you're not going to have a lot to work towards. And that's the only criticism I have of that game, is that there's not enough upgrades to work towards. Yeah, I'm literally collecting the armor just to collect armors. Yep. I don't need any of them, I don't wear them. Mm -hmm. I equip them, look at how pretty they are, and then go back. Yep. So that, that's my only criticism of, of Ghost of Tsushima, but obviously I still love it enough that I've played it. Uh, this is the third time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, so comparing that to Elden Ring, in Elden Ring, and the reason why I think it's such a good open world is because if no matter which point of interest you find, you find a hole in the ground. <laughs> you go into that hole, there's a chest. You open that chest, it's, it's, gonna, a mimic. It's, it's a mimic. <laughs> or it teleports you right in front of a bear. Oh. But you, if it's not a trap, you will find... Fucking Patches. That was Patches' trap. Pa- yeah, Patches Patches is too. an asshole. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, you will find something there. What that thing is, and whether it's useful or not to you, will be entirely dependent on you. For example, let's say that I am playing my current character that I'm going to which I'm not at the DLC yet, by the way, because of time and being an adult sucks. Um, I wish I had more time. But uh, my current character is going to be a dex int build, so fast and casty. My usual? I usually play strength faith, so I was like, I'm going to do the exact opposite for this new character. My goal, since Demon Souls, never get hit. Mm. If you don't get hit, you don't need vigor, you don't need... Poise, you don't need anything else. You just need either magic or stabbies. Mm-hmm. And that's it. You save half the stats. It's more efficient. Holy fuck, it sucks to dodge everything. That is true. <laughs> Very true. That's why I usually have a shield on my character anyway. Even, like, my current character mm-hmm. has a shield. But I usually am two-handing his, um, uh, his weapon. Uh, yeah, so I'm playing, I'm playing this, this Dex Int character. If I find, like, a great sword in that chest, it's not useful to me, right? Mm-hmm. But... If I'm playing a different type of character, uh, if I'm playing my strength faith character, all of a sudden I find a cool greatsword. I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Yeah. But the, the way that Elden Ring is designed is that each and every item could be useful. Yep. In, if, if your character is, is the right build or if you know how to use it. Like, for example, one of the... Uh, like, you, in, in Elden Ring, you can find a bunch of cracked pots. <laughs> that's like me. I'm a crackpot, um, <laughs> but that's a really old term for a crazy person. In case there are any Zoomers watching or listening. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, a lot of people are like, oh, "These things are stupid. I never use them." Me, I'm like, "You don't understand. <laughs> this cracked pot is potential. Yeah, it is potential in my hand." With the crafting system, I can make this a holy grenade. I can make this a lightning grenade. I can make this a sleep grenade. Firebombs. I can make it a firebomb. Yeah. Firebombs for days. There, there's so many tools in that game that, and if you exploit them all, you're gonna have a really, you're gonna have a lot easier time than someone who is just like, I have a sword and I <laughs> roll. <laughs> it's like, okay, if you want to play that way, sweet. Like. That's the other thing. You can completely decide how difficult you want the game to be, right? Like, you can decide to never put points in HP. Sure, go for it. You can decide that that's how you want to play it. That's fine. You can decide to never use any of the tools the game gives you. That's fine, too. I feel attacked. I'm sorry. (laughs) Or you can decide that you want to use everything the game gives to you, and you can, like, crush things if you know their weaknesses and you know, you know, like... The, the, like this, this like water swamp monster. I'm going to throw lightning at it. It's probably weak to that. Oh, look, it's weak to that. You know, like it's totally up to you. Yeah. And that's one of the things I like about it. I got to figure out what the dragon on the broken bridge is weak against. Or not broken bridge. It's a real bridge. Um, if you teleport up to the 
beast clergyman. Yep. And then go down, there's a big dragon, and he eats me a lot. I think I remember which one you're he talking about. He spits a lot of fire. He spits rot, doesn't he? Not fire? Uh, I don't know. I die fast. Oh, okay. <laughs> Try holy. It's probably good. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember what he's weak to. Um, he's not weak to casters who die quick. True. <laughs> the few <laughs> things are. <laughs> oh man, it is a rough game. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the best advice I can give is to reduce your enemy's HP to zero before yours is at zero. You'll win every fight that way. I think there's a few enemies that that's wrong. Uh, I suppose there's a couple. The ones who poison you, start you on fire, throw you down a pit. Well, if you kill them, then you still win. So it's okay if you die after. Uh, victory, uh, the win conditions are different between us. <laughs> <laughs> if I have to pick up my souls, it's a bad day. <laughs> Listen, uh, I've, it, I, have, I have no shame about the fact that sometimes I've killed bosses with poison after I've died. As long as they explode and it says victory before I reload the screen, I still won. And I got their loot. So I still play like I'm in Demon's Soul. <laughs> you can't die or the world becomes worse. Yeah, that's true. But no, Dark... I mean, Elden Ring, death is just an experience. Just a learning experience, <laughs> right? Because think about it this way. I don't care if I die 500 times. If I beat the game, I still beat the game. Mm -hmm. And I'm still better than this person who died 50 times and gave up, right? Yeah. That's a life skill. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> life life skills here. Yeah, we're uh, we're giving life advice. That's that is true in real life. Just don't give up, because if you give up, then that's the only true failure. What is it? The opposite of success is not failure. The opposite of success is quitting. Correct. Yep. Oh, the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh yeah, I I I promised to get back to uh <laughs> to to a couple things. What was the first so, thing? So let's go back to the game designer's curse. Ah, let's yes, let's. Um so I've played so many games over the years, and due to uh both the degree I possess and the I I don't want to I don't want to pretend like I, or I don't want to claim that I have like more design sense than other people or anything like that. You have a lot of experience though. I do have a lot of experience. Um but so because of these factors there are very few games that I end up finishing. Mm. I play almost every like new game at least for oh, a little bit. Your Steam library. My Steam library is in insane you want to crush your ego look at his library and compare it to yours yeah it's like i think there's at least 1200 games i have and i i've played 90 percent of them at least yeah. for a little bit a few years ago it was 360 and i'm like holy fuck i've got like 18 <laughs> and i play games yeah um but the problem is that very few games end up holding my attention mm -hmm. because Basically, the only way that the game can hold my attention nowadays is if it's either incredible, like it does everything so well that I don't care that I've noticed all these things, mm -hmm. or it's doing something very, very unique in such a good way that it holds my attention. Um, I want to pull this back later to the Forever GM problem. Okay. There's infinite games in my backlog that I will never finish, probably. Because, and not because, not even because they're bad, necessarily. Because, it just because I've seen them before. You know, like, with, if, if I'm playing a game that's like maybe an 8 out of 10, mm -hmm. there's a good possibility that I'm never going to finish it because I already know everything about it. Which seems crazy if I've only played it for like an hour or two. It's predictable, you know the trends, they're hitting the right beats, you know what mm -hmm. patterns. Exactly. It's like I've already played this game before in a million other places. Okay, I'm going to segue into the Forever GM thing and we will come back. It okay. will be perfect. The Forever GM problem, I have this all the time and it makes me a very difficult player. Mm -hmm. Which I hate. I want to be a player. <laughs> like I'd like to actually enjoy a game. Mm -hmm. um, as a Forever GM... I have years and years of extremely hard studied, well manufactured games. Like, they don't always go through because sometimes I design for the wrong player set. Mm -hmm. I'll admit that. But 
like you know the beats you know the feel you know everything like that so it's hard to play and someone who's lesser than you i don't know like worse than you newer mm -hmm. god forbid they're less than 20 years experience <laughs> jesus but you can see the beats you can see the mistakes you can see the pacing hiccups mm -hmm. it makes it hard to play as a player mm -hmm. and it's like that kind of sucks <laughs> but it's very similar to the forever gm problem that i face mm -hmm. which also gets me uninvited to games because they're like oh you're not really enjoying it i don't want to be judged because you're so experienced it's like just let me play in a game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but back to game designing, mm -hmm. it's exactly the same as the game designer's curse. Even if it's an 8 out of 10, mm -hmm. it's still hard to play because mm -hmm. you know the patterns. Yeah, uh, nothing, nothing like making me nervous for the upcoming game that you're going to play in of mine. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Don't uninvite me. <laughs> <laughs> I am really looking forward to that one. I'm looking forward to running it. It's, uh, it should be fun uh for for the for the listeners it's a a game that i was designing for my like uh for my uh for my degree like i was designing in my off time while i was in college mm. um and i was writing out the story and the world and this kind of stuff and designing it all my capstone project was uh creating a uh creating a boss fight from that game mm. um and it was going to be a video game but i just I don't have the, I would need more than just me in order to bring it to life in a satisfying way. Yeah. And, uh, and so I decided uh, I was reading through my old like design notebooks and stuff and looking at some of the, a lot of the work that I did for, for that and the world building and stuff. I'm like, man, I still really like this idea and this, this setting and stuff. And, and I was like, I can just reuse it in a, in a tabletop game. Yep. Cause then. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter if I can't do art because people's brains do the art for me. <laughs> you know, back back to the the game designer's curse. I I've talked to a few other designers that have that have like, you know, expressed this, <laughs> um, and I I think it happens to probably a lot of like design minded folks. You know, like yeah, I can appreciate the the artistry of of what other designers are making and stuff, and I can if I'm playing an eight out of ten game you know, I see like what they're going for and I appreciate what they're going for. And I'm like, this is probably a good game, but <laughs> it's just not holding my attention. When I'm reading reviews for a game, I often get very, very angry at reviewers because first of all, games journalists suck. I think we all, we all know this. I think they should spend more time playing games and not sucking instead of just <laughs> writing reviews and trying to rage bait people. I often get angry at them when a reviewer says like oh this this part of this game is so like it is so like bad like i I'm, I'm not enjoying this part of this game i'll often if i'm playing through a game and if i'm thinking about like how would i review this game if even if i'm i stop playing it and i'm like this game isn't for me i'm not going to play this anymore i still can recognize <laughs> the parts of it that are good and be like even though this game isn't for me, this is probably like an 8 or 8.5 <laughs> out of 10 is. for someone else. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, uh, I don't know. I think, I think uh, reviewers need to be more responsible about removing their own biases from their reviews and recognizing the good aspects of a game. Yeah. To be fair, I actually played through Celeste recently, which Celeste was like, oh, revolutionary, amazing, something or other back yeah. in its day. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm finally going to play through it because I don't have time to play everything on stream that I have saved up. Mm -hmm. So I played it. I enjoyed it. It was really good. Um, but I got, I don't know, halfway through it. And I'm like, okay, I'm kind of done with the game, kind of. Mm -hmm. And then I pushed myself through it artificially. And I actually found that it hits really hard at the ending. Mm -hmm. Like, I highly recommend play it through to beat it. Beat the game. You don't have to collect the strawberries. The collectibles. <laughs> they even say at the beginning, give you absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Not even a achievement. Yeah, I was actually wrong about that because the story is what carried Celeste. Mm -hmm. The gameplay was great. But yeah, I was really pleasantly surprised that it hit a really human feel at the end. Mm -hmm. 
but I am a sucker for story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's one of the, that'll be one of my challenges for uh, DMing for you, mm. is making sure the story's satisfying. Because, like, I can, I, the, the story that I've been telling in my current uh, campaign that I'm running is, I mean, it's not the most complex thing in the world. It's just, like, it's a, it's a device for the, for the players to, you know, I mean, they're enjoying it. It's not like they're not liking it. It's just, like, from, a, from my perspective, I feel like I wrote it very, like, too, it, it's too simple. It's weaker than you hope, but the players are in it for the spectacle, they're for the system, they're for the mm -hmm. world. Yeah. So, which you do great, by the way. And so I think that is the perfect blend for them for what they want. So, like, you lucked out. Like, that is a great combination. Mm -hmm. I happen to design not for the players sometimes, and that <laughs> bites me in the ass. But yeah, I guess my point is I'm going to have to spend more time writing the story for the game you're going to be in because I know that's what you enjoy. Mm -hmm. So, but I have. YouTube tutorials on that. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I'll have, to, uh, I'll have to study them. Uh, plug myself. Yeah. <laughs> Go see me. Subscribe. Do all the other shit. Anyways. Oh, speaking of that, mm. long ago I was supposed to throw a plug in because mm. I hate plugging myself. I hate saying, mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Like, comment, subscribe. Mm -hmm. It's boring. It's dumb. It's stupid. So, if you could recommend new game designers to one channel who they could like and subscribe to, who would it be? Okay. I, I pulled it up so I, I wouldn't forget. I know eventually some cheeky asshole is going to say me. <laughs> <laughs> and it can be people who comment and ask if we like your channel. Um, okay. So I, I pulled out a few, actually. I know you wanted a smaller one, uh -oh. so I found a smaller one first. His channel is Michael Coca, which is... Uh, Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, Koka, K-O-C-H-A. He is a solo dev, and he's making a game called Swords and Magic and Stuff, is the title. <laughs> um, it's, it's just a, it's a silly little game, but the thing that I like about his channel is that he is posting dev updates. He, you can go back through his backlog, and he's posting like the whole design process. Mm -hmm. He's going through making his game. Um, he used to stream on Twitch, and I was trying to find his Twitch channel, and I think the VODs might be gone, um, but he used to stream all the time when he was working on it. Um, someone who does that right now is Pirate Software. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, he's huge, though. Everybody's heard about him. But We'll plug him anyway. He does not need the help, but he he's awesome. Not. He is awesome. He's a cool guy, and he goes through... like He, is, he streams himself making his game, so yeah. it's, that's another really good... If you can find people that are actively making a game, and that there's a whole like game design category on Twitch, I believe. Oh, cool. Um, so like just watch people make their games. Like you can ask them questions too if they're smaller. I want to. Like I've got some programs I really want to make, and I'm like, okay, once I get enough that I can hire an editor and things like that, like mm -hmm. I have a Patreon, oh, plug it, oh, disgusting me. <laughs> Anyways, like once I make it big enough. I want to do that so bad, so I love these guys. Yeah, so... so we got Michael... Yeah, Michael, Michael Coca. Coca. Everyone knows Pirate Software. Um, yeah. But another one that the, these guys make... They're bigger-ish. They're like 330K subscribers, but Design Doc. They go through a lot of... Um, they're still actively posting as well, so that's good. Um, but they go through a lot of different... Um, like ideas and mechanics of games and how they work and why they work. Oh, cool. Um, so they're uh so they're like one of just one of the random ones that's recommending me um is risky healing. How can you spice up a healing system? Mm -hmm. So they go into like stuff like that and they they're like, yeah, how do you like juice up this mechanic? How do how do you make a shop good? You know? Oh wow. Like they go through a lot of stuff. I think they've they've been making videos for a lot several years. I gotta say, risky healing. I've used that principle before. I don't know what his video is about. Mm -hmm. Risky healing. I had one where it knocked the person out because it did so much subdual damage, like like uh, knock people out kind of damage. Mm -hmm. But it healed their lethal wounds, so they stopped mm. bleeding. Right. And oh, I fucking loved it. You can ask Shane about it. It was a healing potion that rendered your flesh back together. Ooh. And it, it would just hurt so bad it would put people into shock and knock them out. Right. And it's like, it was such a beautiful cost for healing mm -hmm. versus D&D &D where it's like, oh, boop, 
you're healed. Yeah. There's no fun in that. Mm -hmm. Ugh. But yeah, that sounds like he's got a lot of good shit. Anyway, uh, yeah. So those are those are like off the top of my head three good design channels I'd recommend. Since we're going over the limit, I'm actually going to plug Audio Dread. He's an audio designer who made a couple games that I actually streamed. A uh, really cool guy. He wants to make an achievement for not dodging the entire game because <laughs> I didn't know there was a dodge button. Oh. And I beat his whole game without dodging. Oh, that well, was there a you go. fucking nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cool guy. But yeah, let's plug these guys. Give them some love. So what's the biggest thing you keep in mind when you're designing a game, whether it's tabletop or video games or otherwise? Um, let me start by giving an example of something that I hate. <laughs> I, I told you I'd cycle back around to Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Oh, no, actually. you did. I did. All right. Let's talk for a sec. Let, let's talk for a sec about those. So the world design of those two games great like atmospheric uh very lived in very like you know the exploration is fun there's a lot of really good aspects of those two games mm -hmm. however i have played and beat both and i think i 100 percented both no wow. not the korok poop hat <laughs> fuck that thing <laughs> but everything else i think i got damn okay well, uh, then, you know. We're on different we're, sides. We're on different sides. <laughs> I've played both for a couple dozen hours mm -hmm. total combined. Um, what I could never get past was the durability system. Oh. 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 Okay. I agree with you. A hundred percent. I'm a cheating asshole. Yeah, you duplicated stuff. <laughs> I found a great weapon, I made this amazing thing, and I duplicated the fuck out of it. Mm. I increased all my weapon slots, all my bow slots, and I duplicated everything. Mm -hmm. So yes, I agree the durability, I, I cheated my way around. Mm -hmm. So, the, it, it is such a uh, God. burden. It's a burden, yes. It's such a burden and such a shame. Because, like... <sighs> I get what they were going for. It's a really clever idea. I get what they were going for, the and they just... implementation, like, I don't know how I would tweak it. I do. I solved it in three different ways. <laughs> okay, game designer. <laughs> Let's hear this. Well, Tell me how Nintendo can better. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's very, um, uh, it's, I know it's very... Uh, They're a small publisher. Let's plug Nintendo. Yeah. <laughs> It, it may be a, a little bit arrogant of me to assume that I know better than them, but I know better than them in this case. <laughs> okay. Um, like I told you, I'm correct. So let me, let me first start by telling you why it bothers me so much. Okay. So I have an example from Tears of the Kingdom, two examples from Tears of the Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't remember my time with Breath of the Wild, but I have two examples of Tears, from Tears of the Kingdom. Okay. All right. I was exploring around, I found a cave, and I'm like, I'm gonna go into the cave. And so I go into this cave, and uh, I'm like, you know, making my way through, getting stuff, and then I get to the end of the cave, and I'm like, oh, there's a shrine up there, I need to go to that shrine. So I, wa you know, walk across the cave to go up to the shrine, and then all of a sudden a boss health bar appears. Mmm, I think I know where you are. Yeah, and uh, it was like Shadow of Calamity or something, and yep. I'm like... And I'm like, oh, and then it's, it's fucking Ganon, the shadow version of him, Ganondorf, like running at me. And I'm like, with oh. Gra with grabby hands. With grabby hands. And uh, yeah, I was, like, I was like, oh, oh my God. And so he killed me because that's like supposed to be a really hard challenge. I'm like, well, shit. So I spend, I Dark Souls that shit and I spend several, like, several attempts going back and fighting him because I'm like, because I'm like, I'm doing damage. I can figure out a way to kill him. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I eventually figured it out. Um, the, the solution was throwing lots of bombs and yep. cheesing and, but I did it, right? I killed him and I'm like, sweet, what's my loot for killing this, this big boss? Um, I got a sword, a, a katana, like, uh, uh, like a corrupted katana or something. A really cool, powerful katana. Yeah. And whenever you hold it, it drains your life. And I'm like, oh, this is a sick weapon. Like, this is really cool. And I'm like... But, man, it drains my life whenever I hold it. How am I going to be able to use this weapon? 
And I'm like, by not using it, of course. <laughs> and so I took a, I took a club mm -hmm. and I fused the, the sword to the club. I'm not holding the sword. It's not damaging me. Yep. And I'm still hitting people with it. And it does a shit ton of And it of does damage. a shit ton of damage. I'm like, I am a fucking genius. <laughs> I, I have, I just, I gamed this. And I, this is mine now, and it's my emergency weapon. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Because I know the durability system exists. So I'm like, this is my emergency weapon. I'll use it on really hard enemies. I come across a Hinox on a bridge. And I'm like, time to pull out my katana. Oh, yeah. And so I'm like, here, I'm like, I'm like, Katana, we're, let, let's do this. And I'm like, I go up to him and I'm just like, bam, bam, bam. And it breaks. Yep. Four hits. Gone. I can't describe to you the rage that I felt. That I went through all this effort to get this weapon and it breaks in four hits. Are you kidding me? You must be. That this can't be a, this, this isn't a real game. I, I, <laughs> I, I was like, I'm dreaming. This isn't a real game. Nobody would make that decision. What designer makes, makes the decision that your weapon that you just spent like two hours throwing yourself against the boss to defeat just, just breaks in a few hits? It's not a real game. I played most of the game with bombs. Yeah, I mean, like, what are you supposed to do? Like, if your weapons just shatter immediately. Nickel and dime everything until you duplicate because you can afford a house. <laughs> and the second the second example I have so I complete the wind temple right in the uh the Rito village yep and I'm like okay cool and I'm talking to the inhabitants and stuff I'm like someone probably has a quest for me here and one of the people is like oh yes if you bring me all these rare materials I'll make you a bow of this legendary bow oh. and I'm like sweet like Surely a legendary bow doesn't break, right? It's a legendary bow. I have to bring him like diamonds and shit. Yeah, you do. I'm like, I'm like, the, great, cool, legendary bow. Diamonds are strong. Yes, diamonds are strong. So I do, I do the quest. I find, I go and find all the materials. I bring them back. I get this legendary bow. I'm like, cool. I never have to worry about bows again because this won't break. Surely. Yeah, it broke after like 15 shots, I think. On Something the legendary like weapon kick, the Sword of Seven from the Gerudo, all hell, uh, was it Rito, Riza? Uh, I don't know, the Gerudo Princess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cutie, like mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, Gerudo have always been my passion point since uh, Zelda Ocarina of Time on the 64. But, the Sword of Seven, also legendary weapon. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Mm -hmm. But, you can't dual wield it like her. I was like, really? Fuck you. <laughs> I was really looking forward to that Aww. when I finally got two of them. Ah, but also they break. Also they break. Which is really funny because you can, you can dual wield them if you attach a Sword of Seven to a Sword of Seven. Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> then you're dual wielding. Yeah, sure. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I quit after my legendary bow broke. That's when I stopped playing. The silver bow. The legendary one that you can climb Castle Hyrule and find in the, like a missing brick of the top tower. Mm -hmm. It's the bow that kills Ganon. It's the silver arrow shooting bow. Okay, yeah. It still breaks. I was like, fuck you, that's lore. For fuck's sake. Okay, now, so... I'm fine with the Master Sword coming back. If these bows and crazy weapons would die for like 10 minutes, fine. Yeah. So yeah, let's talk about, so that's, now that we've established why that pisses us off, um, let me tell you how terrible of a game design choice that is. Players want to be rewarded. And if your reward is transient like that and so mm -hmm. temporary, it feels like all of your effort is for nothing. Yeah. It'd be nice if there was a merchant who could like duplicate or reformat weapons. Yeah, let me tell you about my solutions. Oh, yes, go ahead. So, uh so the the easiest thing that they possibly could have done was just have them be broken temporarily, right? Like you swing it for 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 game balance purposes, I understand. Like you've got this crazy strong katana, it should, you know, not be able to be used 100% of the time. Fine. 
have it break, and then you've got the shards of it in your inventory, and you can reforge it at a fire for some materials. Yeah. Right? Easiest thing that they could have done. And I would still be, have played the game and probably 100% of it, right? If they wanted to have... Because I, I, heard, I heard someone... I was watching a lot of videos on this topic when it came <laughs> out. And I heard one person defending it being like, well, it's because, you know, they want you to have a constant sense of progression. They want you to have, you know, be constantly finding stronger weapons and not still use your old weapons. And I'm like, well, first of all, I would use a stronger weapon anyway. But second of all, if you want that to be a progression uh, metric, then how about having your weapons be able to be upgraded, right? Mm. Like, they kind of did this with the fusion system, but also they still break. So, but like... You know, all right. I found the I found this guard's short sword, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're collecting materials the entire game, so let's funnel some of the materials into your weapons and then have it upgrade to a guard short sword plus one or whatever. You know, yeah, with a higher durability, right? Or and and then have like the reforge system still. <laughs> it's just <laughs> there were so many things they could have done to just fix it, to just to just make it less arduous. And I hated how I had, like, I as a Dark Souls player had to come back to dungeons or, like, random monster camps. Random. Mm -hmm. I had to come back to areas because I was using a weapon and it broke before I started cheating and got fed up with it. Mm -hmm. Because I couldn't kill bokoblins, like the little guys. Yep. Because my weapon broke and the shit they have can't kill themselves. Right. That's like, it's... It's almost unfair. Mm -hmm. It is unfair. It's it's stupid. It's 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 a design decision that I don't understand why it was made, and all of the reasons that I've heard for it being made are dumb. Like they're the the reasons from like the designers themselves. They were like, "Well, we don't want you to have. They, we don't want you to use the same weapon over and over. Like we want you to use different weapons, and we also want the." gameplay loop of like you being in peril because you're constantly like worrying about your weapons durability and i'm like you can't do that long term yeah you can't i'm uh, that's gonna one that's gonna wear the players out yeah. if you're constantly worrying two and and really take away from the experience of exploring because you're always going to be worrying about if your weapons are gonna break and if you're gonna have enough swords mm -hmm. which is stupid let me explore your damn world yeah i play a lot of horror games and horror is my favorite I know about suspense and yeah. like impending doom, and that is you can't just keep sandpapering your fucking players. It's it's obnoxious, and I just maybe maybe I should just uh, legally emulate it because I own the game. Um, <laughs> maybe I should just le emulate it, and someone surely has made a mod that re removes durability. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I don't sure. know that or just duplicate. Just I I God it just. And what makes me even more angry is all the 10 out of 10s it got. Like, to be fair, I 100%ed it. I know, but... Well, okay, 99%ed it. <laughs> this is another thing why I don't like game designers, or sorry, game uh, journalists, because game journalists are just... Some of them are paid to give a review. That too. That pisses me off too. But like, everybody's fucking blind. You know, like, I I'm, going, I'm going off now. <laughs> um, but... Seriously, even if you think a game is 10 out of 10, if it has a system in it like that that's going to prevent people from being able to play the game because it pisses them off so much, mm. you got to take a number off. Like, I'm sorry, but yeah. even if you personally think that this thing is perfect, you got to have the introspection to be able to be like, I only think, like, to be able to be like, I think this is perfect, but I know it's not for everyone. Actually, back to the journalist thing. Um, specifically on a lot of these journalists, I do not look at them, so I have no idea. Help me out here. Mm -hmm. Is it one per large company, or are these individual channels who are, like, bloggers or whatnot? Um, so I watch both. Like, I watch YouTube reviewers that are independent, and then also I read reviews from major companies. Okay, so I have something to add for the big companies. I think that we should go back towards the smaller viewers, but they should be transparent about this is my kind of game and this is this and that. Yeah. Because I did like how, where is it? Like 
Mystery 2000 or something. I don't know. Um, there's a whole ton of old movie reviewers. Mm -hmm. And they would give great movies shit reviews or mm -hmm. shit movies great reviews depending on what they actually prefer. And what happened is back in the day when there were only so many, you would find the reviewer who had similar taste to you and they would be your god in future and you would follow them to death. <laughs> right. And I think that's what should happen now, but people are monopolizing attention and time and also like their judgment is skewed because they're not giving a proper review. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, if a game is unplayable, but the story is beautiful, sorry, you can't give it a 10 out of 10. Yeah, if sorry. If it's behind a gameplay wall. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I think. Like, that's actually my critique with Celeste. It's challenging, it's beautiful, but I could not give it a 10 out of 10 because, I don't know, the gameplay, like, right when I got tired was, like, two minutes from when it cusped over, so it's real picky. Mm -hmm. But amazing game. I do recommend pushing through and beating it. But it got a little bit stale to the point where if I'm not a completionist like I am, like, I wouldn't have given it a good review. Mm -hmm. and I was like, ah. Gameplay walls are real difficult. Like, they gotta knock something off the score. Yeah, I, I, I really just... It blows my mind that... Eh, anyway. Like the barrier to entry to uh, Cipher, Song of Ice and Fire, uh, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Sorry, I knew the books before the show was even conceived of. Played the tabletop before that. There's a tabletop of it. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I played that just out of high school. Wow. <laughs> it's like, it's old. Mm -hmm. But anyways, Game of Thrones, everyone complains when they read the first book. Oh man, first chapter, they drop like 30 names mm -hmm. in the first paragraph. They're like, here's the dinner table with blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And it's like the intro to Skyrim. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just drop all the fucking names of everyone. No, you can't do that. It's information overload. It's inaccessible. It would be like if we started talking about like specific game engines on here with no context. Mm -hmm. It's just... That's not... It's not kind to your viewers. Yeah. And we're not doing this to just ego boost or like masturbate on like game design. We're doing this to publish for people to learn and understand and like corroborate. Mm -hmm. So we should probably get back to that question we that you should. asked me. Which is <laughs> what I'm designing things. What am I thinking about? <laughs> Durability um, systems. <laughs> I got, I got, uh, I tangented because I had to explain what I think is bad. And Ugh. to wrap all of that up, what I think is bad is not rewarding your players substantially. Mm. So when I'm designing something, whether it be video or video game or tabletop game, I always keep in mind the rewards I'm giving to the players. If, and even if I didn't necessarily plan to give them a reward, that happens a lot in tabletop. When your players are like, uh, you're, you know, you're describing a scene and you're like, oh, you know, there's, there's like this big shiny building that you're going to, like you have a mission to go and infiltrate and yada, yada, yada. But there's also this like bar across this, across the street that has a neon sign and what's it, and you're just, you know, scene dressing, but they're like, the bar. The bar has something in it. It must have <laughs> something in it. We're gonna find an executive from that company there, and then we, and then we can like coerce him or something. And it's like they're convinced. Yeah, they're convinced. Uh, and so it's like, well, I didn't intend for that, but you know, I guess it exists now. Sure, it's not the worst. Th it's not the worst idea in the world. And so, and then you know, it, but it it really is. It's all about it's all about rewards for I I think for for increasing players' engagement and really encouraging them to actually engage with the game, right? Because you know, if there are too many times in a row that a player goes somewhere to find nothing, they're gonna stop going somewhere, right? They're yep. gonna they're gonna just like okay, I guess I'll walk straight to the objective and not care about anything else and not be engaged. Yeah. So whatever, whatever that, fl whatever flavor of reward exists in your game, like just have something that the player can find. Like even, even if it's just a bit of currency or a health potion, right? Like players still like it, you know? 
I'm I'm one of those players that uh, has severe uh, too good to use syndrome for basically every oh. item ever, um, and so because I'm always like in in like JRPGs and specifically, I'm always like. No, I need that elixir for later, right? Yeah. I'm not going to use it now. And then I end the game with <laughs> maxed out elixirs in my inventory. It's like, it's Sephiroth. I still can't use it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he'll have another phase. <laughs> That's right. And he did. But anyway. And, but maybe he'll have a third and we yeah. can't use it. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, yeah. But anyway, it's, it's not even that. It's like, I, you know, it doesn't matter. I open a chest. I find a potion. I'm like, hell yeah, a potion. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh this <laughs> I have a slight critique of the system that I'm using for my tabletop game. I'm currently using the <laughs> Cyberpunk Red system. Um and man, it is not fleshed out. If you for the type of game I want to play, for the type of game that I created, um I wanted to have it be a long campaign, but the system is very much designed, uh, and I didn't realize till too late, for uh short bursts like one or two shots and like any cyberpunk series your characters are gonna die yeah quick. that's that's what it's intended but that's not what i wanted and so i kind of had to mold the system i had to i i've written so much extension for that system to support what i wanted that i could like publish an errata probably and it would be like <laughs> half the length of the main book <laughs> I I made new items, I made entire upgrade systems, I made like new classes, I made everything. Uh you've shown me that stuff. It is pages of crazy. It is. Like it is nuanced, it is very specific. Like holy shit, dude. Yeah. But that's why we started with you being the passionate one about game design. <laughs> it's true. It's true. ADHD doesn't help. That uh, <laughs> leads to the hyper focus and then it's all over. Um, like, but I could do this better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sometimes you just gotta move on. <laughs> it's it's okay if it's not perfect right now. You know, it'll be fine. But, <laughs> yeah. So that's what I focus on. I focus on reward systems, and because I like a good reward system, you know, one of the so uh, a game that I've been. Uh, a game genre that I both hate and love is the a, the gotcha game genre. Oh. I have been playing uh, Honkai Star Rail, and I despise <laughs> the gotcha system in general. However, the progression system is very, very satisfying and something that you can't really find in other genres of games. I log in every day, I grind for a little bit, and try to get better gear for my people until I'm out of energy, and then I log out. And then, ev and then every like month when a character comes out that I really want, hopefully I have enough currency saved up from playing the game to get them. Yeah. You know? But, would I recommend that to everybody? No. No, that is very niche and very addictive. Correct. And that's why it is everywhere in Japan. Correct. Oh my god, they're... Uh, I will not go into that, but there's a lot of them in Japan. There are a lot of them. But it's about the reward system, right? I log in, I get shinies. That's how it works. And I like rewards. I Were I to design something like that, though, it would be a lot more player-friendly. Jesus Christ. At least with the acquiring of characters. Because I think, I think it's really rude that... You don't even you can't even get a character unless you have been saving up for months and have played every day or give them like two hundred and fifty dollars because I think that's how much it is to guarantee it's like two hundred and fifty dollars to guarantee a character if you have no other currency it's it's really it's obscene it really is it is very profitable yes, they are the biggest company out of it's a Chinese game actually or no Korean Chinese. Whatever. They're like they're 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 the biggest game company out of their home country now. Jesus. I can definitely see that because it's not human focused. Mm -mm. Oh man. It's real pretty, but it's not human focused. Mm -mm. The story's fun though. <laughs> That's yeah. It's like I'm there for the story and the progression. And I get really pissed off at the gotcha when I do like 160 pulls and still don't get the character I want. 
It just seems to be how it goes with those, because that's gambling. It is. The house always wins. Yep. And then Cole uh, goes for that character and gets them after 20 pulls, and I get very mad at him. Because <laughs> his luck is good and mine is bad. Mm. And that's just how it is. That's what you get for bitching about the game. It's true. <laughs> they can hear you. They can hear me. They have yeah. the TikTok mod. It's <laughs> yeah, the, like, they're listening to everyone. They can. <laughs> yeah. So... I'm curious, do you have a favorite moment in designing any game that you've ever had? Mm. What was the most enjoyable thing to ever design that made you get the happy feelies? Well, let's see. Beyond the, if you're a coder, you understand this, when it compiles and runs the first time. Oh, <laughs> no bugs. <laughs> oh, man. You all know that feeling if you're a coder. Um, but besides that, my favorite moment of design is showing it to someone else and, or having them experience it or something like that. That is my favorite. I'm not designing things for me. I'm designing things for other people, right? Fair. Like for my tabletop games, when I'm designing something, I'm constantly thinking about how will my players respond to this? Um, I sometimes, uh, in, in my cyberpunk game. Uh, I sometimes feel like I'm making my, my bosses a bit too video gamey, but, <laughs> um, but I mean, my players seem to enjoy it. So you it know. fits the theme a little better than it D&D does. would. Yeah. But no, my, yeah, my favorite moment of design is showing it to someone else. Absolutely. Because if I'm, if I'm making like a video game, like when I was, when I was making my capstone project, I was constantly like asking people to play it. I'm like, I'm like, can you like, here, play this, like, let me know how it feels, you know? And like, you know, people would play it and they'd, they'd be like, oh, that was cool. Or like, you know, oh, that, I like that part. Like, you know, that's, it's great. It's cathartic. So when did it not go according to Keikaku? Uh, well, I showed it to, uh, one of my, one of my teachers, the, <laughs> no. my capstone project. Now, now granted me and him, this was, uh, this was, uh, Johan sensei. Yeah, we love our teachers. We'll give them shit, but we fucking love them. They were great. He, yeah, Johan Sensei and I have very different ideas of what makes something fun. And he does not like complexity in things, at least in, in game mechanics. And I like complexity in game mechanics. And so when he played my capstone project, um, he was like, he just gave me a look and he was like, why is it so complicated? And I'm like, well, because the, you know, like, and I went into like talking about the design choices. He's like, but why go through all that effort? I just want to hit things and see numbers and see it go and see it die. And I'm like, well, yeah, but that's not what I'm really going for. And he's like, why? Because <laughs> <laughs> you're different players. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, and whatever. And that, but that did teach me a lesson. Whatever I make, it's always not going to be for everyone. Mm -hmm. and that's just how it is. And that's what you have to accept and, you know, move on. Even though I'm always right. Um. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's just, whatever you make is just not going to be for everybody. You have to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Which means my thumbnails and titles are perfect. Game? Game? Oh, sorry. I guess that you don't remember that. Uh, there, one of the thumbnails for your videos was oh. just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I, <laughs> I have a blank, like, random game because I don't always have time to make a game. Thumbnail. It was just really <laughs> funny. <laughs> After the streams, I make a thumbnail. So, it's like I don't always start on plan time. Uh, there's never enough time. No, that's what it all comes down to. That too. But yeah, <laughs> game. Game. <sighs> So, I try to end these podcasts with a question from the previous interviewee. Oh, okay. I remembered everything speaking of game. Game? I have forgot that at home. Oh, <laughs> well. I will have to think up a challenge for you myself. Mm, okay. How do you deal with requests from a player making a character that are unreasonable for your game? Hmm, okay. So... Depending on how unreasonable it is, like if we're talking super unreasonable, absolutely cannot be done. Um, I would ask them why. That's my number one question <laughs> because <laughs> because that's important, right? Like why why are they insistent on doing this? Like 
<laughs> if you're playing a historically accurate medieval game, but they want to play an elf, why? Why do you want to play an elf? And, you know, sometimes it'll be something like, I just think they're cool. And, it's, and then it's like, okay, well, can we work together to, to figure out a, a different way for this, to, for this to work out for you? Sometimes it'll, it'll, you might have to ask a few questions and have a little bit of like people skills to really dig to what, to what the reason is. Because I've found like some people I've interacted with, they just want to feel special. And like, okay, let's find a different way to do that, right? Like, maybe you can involve them more deeply in a certain plot element, right? Or, you know, just like give them a little artifact that does something special that other people don't have, you know? And you got to be careful with that, though, because then other people might be jealous. But it's all about, it's, it's about knowing your group and your group dynamics, too. But yeah, dig, dig to why. Why, why, do they, why are they insistent on doing on, on this specific thing? Maybe if it if it's something like where and we could, we can go to ifs all day, but <laughs> if it's something where it's like you know they just really have this like character in mind and nothing else will work. They want to play a character from an anime they love. Mm. Oh boy, I've seen this so many times. Yeah, that's <laughs> a tough one. I mean, some you could in that in that case you could offer something like, well, that might that's really not going to work for this world, but let's let's shelve that for now and my next game or like i'll run a one to three shot and you can play that character i try to i try to never say hard no's to people unless it's like you know certain very specific or very stupid things um i i try to be like that you know that won't work here but let's talk about what we can do to make you to make to, to fulfill the feeling for you because let's be honest, tabletop games for most people are about feelings, right? Like, I know there's, there's a couple, <laughs> something, something that's always been a little bit strange to me, and maybe it's just me, is like the Pathfinder League stuff. And like the, the like, I think there's a D&D one too, like the Adventures Guild thing where it's like, you have your character that you take from game to game and play in different games and stuff. That's always felt really weird to me because because it's like I don't know. For for me, my tabletop games are self-contained, right? And and that's when I play in one, I want it to be self-contained. And I don't want my character from that game to go into other games and groups because it feels weird. Mm -hmm. It would be like us just randomly going to a different game and being like, hello, friends who I've never met. Right. Let's go to the gas station together. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, I, am. I get it. <laughs> like they're gonna look at you and like skirt away. <laughs> yep. Uh, to circle back, when someone makes an unreasonable request, ask them why it's so important to them, and then you can go from there because there will be a reason. Very few. It would be a really weird type of person that would be insistent on something for no reason. So they might not tell you the reason either, which is frustrating. They might not know it. They might not know it. Yeah, you have to dig. Mm -hmm. At part of being a good game master is having people skills. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that don't have people skills, you can cultivate them. I promise. You can learn. You get lots of motivation as a GM. Yes. It's, it's tough work sometimes, but you'll get there. <laughs> <laughs>